Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Swarm. Welcome to The Swarm, everyone. This is our second to last episode of 2018. It's kind of nuts. It's gone by really fast, I feel like, James. Yeah, it's been great. We've been really humbled about all the great feedback we've gotten. We've had some really great guests, and we've really enjoyed ourselves. All right, and for this second to last episode, um, James and I really thought, you know, we couldn't go the whole season really without talking about Louisiana's coastline. Very important here. So being a native of New Orleans and southern Louisiana and the Gulf Coast, we are very much impacted by the climate and the coastal erosion and um, the water that has infiltrated our lives. And we as architects use that to our advantage to design around. And it's something we have to consider when we do design things. So with that being said, I would like to introduce Liz Williams Russell. She is now the Coastal Community Resilience Director for the Foundation for Louisiana. And we'll be talking all things coast. If you're from the Gulf South, if you're from New Orleans, if you're interested in this, if you're interested in climate change, um, coastal erosion, this is going to be a great episode for you. Uh, She's a very interesting person. She's very captivating. And she's very passionate about what she does. Here she is. Hi, everyone. I'm James. And I am Seamus. And you are listening to The The Swarm, Swarm, a podcast about architecture and design. We're two architects at the firm Cicada here in New Orleans. The Swarm is an outlet that brings the world of architecture to the people. Our goal is to educate our listeners about design and construction by interviewing locals who are making an impact on their community. All right, everybody. um, We have Liz Russell, Liz Williams Russell on the show today. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. We're we're super excited to have you on. Um, being from Louis, well, I guess before I get get onto um, you guys know each other. We do. So quick background: <laughs> Liz and I, um, Liz and I do know one another. We both went to LSU Architecture School together, and um, and from there, kind of took different professional paths, yep. um, which has actually been extremely interesting because um, I've stayed on more of the traditional architectural path, whereas Liz has kind of. Um, been behind the scenes in saving our earth path. Saving Louisiana. <laughs> That's so huge. Thank you. Whoa. Yeah. We're, we're here we'll trying see. to do this and you're saving the it's world. Definitely not a one person task. So don't put <laughs> don't don't put too much. But um Captain but Planet over here. All, all goofiness <laughs> aside, we're extremely happy to have you on. Um Liz um, Russell is her actual title is uh, she works for the Foundation for Louisiana and she is the Coastal Community Resilience Director. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. Liz, I'm going to kind of let you um, tell our audience um, who you work for and if you could briefly summarize what you do. Sure. Um, I will I will attempt to do that. So uh, I manage our coastal and climate portfolio, essentially. Uh, the Foundation for Louisiana was actually started five days after Hurricane Katrina, uh, meant to be a philanthropic intermediary that could pull in diverse funding uh, from all sorts of donors, the country of Japan, the Bush Clinton Katrina fund, oh, wow. um, text this number kind of thing. So your company uh-huh. was founded literally after Katrina. Right after Katrina. Crazy. Okay. We are essentially a statewide social justice organization. Okay. Um, so you do we, quite a variety of things. Quite a, dry, a variety of things. Uh, we have portfolios in the criminal justice space, um, in, in racial healing and justice, um, in housing. Uh, we provide grant support to lots of community-based partners that really don't identify as any single issue area. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I manage our coastal and climate portfolio. Um, and the Coastal Resilience Leverage Fund was established back at the end of 2015. Um, and I came on not long after. Can you give me an example of how our audience may kind of understand where you guys come into play if something were to happen, I guess, to their community or something like that? So... A lot of the work that we do is not just in the days after an event. However, obviously, mm-hmm. when there is an event, uh, there's usually a, an influx of cash that, that needs to get down to partners on the ground. Um, but we uh, are always sort of working behind the scenes to cultivate the work so that we're not always responding to a single event. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the coastal space, uh, that means working with community partners um, in various coastal communities or in the city of New Orleans, uh, who, again, don't really identify as just coastal um, or just environmental, uh, but they really see the intersection of issues of water, issues of flood risk, um, impacting their everyday lives in a, in, a, in, a, in a more regular way, That whether that has to do with job access or getting your kids to school or the types of housing and insurability um, that you have access to. 
and then if there is a disaster, um, we are, are sort of prepared to take in donations um, and then move rapid response um, funds out to organizations. Um, I should also mention we have partners that range from those intimate local level partners mm -hmm. all the way up to sort of state allies and, and national and global allies in some cases. Uh, so we work with regional NGOs for regional nonprofits. Uh, we work with local community-based partners who maybe work in a single parish and then others who work across six parishes, um, as well as we've worked with government partners, whether that's the city of New Orleans or uh, the state of Louisiana. So you manage the Coastal Resilience Leverage Fund. Yes. And how did you get to that position? Yeah, so <laughs> that's kind of a long one. Um, so Hurricane Katrina hit while I was in architecture school. Um, and a lot of the baggage that I carried was sort of buried by um, the system of checklists and, and sort of classes and courses that was our traditional um, architectural education. Um, I, uh, in 2010, moved overseas and moved to London uh, to be to accidentally really begin pulling apart some of that. So I was uh, lucky enough to go to the Bartlett uh, School of Architecture for my master's, um, and they really provided the flexibility for you to, you know, do whatever you want as long as you do it well and make sort of beautiful work. Your master's uh, thesis, what was that about? So I basically spent a year exploring the Mississippi River. Uh, at the time, I would have told you that I was looking at the Mississippi River as a way of looking at American culture. Um, frankly, it's a history of uh, political and economic conditions influencing how we construct our infrastructure. Um, and, and so I really had the privilege of pulling apart some of that. Um, at the time, you know, I had to work on a thesis, but I also was creating uh, huge images after images in, in England, their A1 drawings, which is like 24 by 33 inches, and I, you know, tens and tens of them. Um, uh, and, and I feel really lucky to have been given the flexibility to explore that, because frankly, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now um, without that. Right. It's interesting how, like, your, your path through education whether you know it or not, or not at the time, it's certainly influencing clearly where, where you're going to be within the next couple of years. Yeah, so I had, um, I had tried to return to traditional architecture practice after finishing my master's. And I also had been given the opportunity to begin teaching uh, first-year architecture at a university outside of London. Um, and so part of the week I was sort of working there and part of the week I was working in the firm. Um, and frankly, it was at the height of the economic downturn. Mm -hmm. I felt very lucky to even have a job. My former colleagues from my master's in extraordinary school of architecture were having lots of trouble getting any sort of bites on their portfolios. Um, and, and after a couple of months there, um, there was a prospect of, of me sort of working with a number of unpaid interns um, and helping to manage them that uh, were frankly selected by their proximity to the office uh, oh. because legally you have to pay for their travel. Oh, interesting. Um, so uh, I quit very suddenly uh, and went straight to a pub where I had been a regular and asked if I could have a job. Oh. <laughs> nice. Um, was, that, was that the pub where you met the gentleman from Sierra Nevada? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Cool. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. Wait, what? I don't Liz know this story. Liz has actually <laughs> met the the Steve Grossman. Was he the brewmaster or the owner? Uh, or both? One of one of the owners, one of the founders. Okay. Um, uh, Side note. The Grossman brothers worked on this together, but luckily I I didn't do any uh, trash talking about his beer because I was you, you, quite frank with oh, people. He didn't reveal it right away. He did no, not. So, so he did not. Yeah. So um, I I was quite used to having customers be like, so what's good, you know? Um, and I was like, this is crap. Don't get that. You know, try this out. <laughs> um, and luckily I had I had not said anything bad about his beer. <laughs> um, and I recognized an American accent, so I said, you know, where are you from in the States? And he said, I'm from Northern California. I said, oh, cool, where, you know? He's like, Chico. And I, um, not many folks, not too many folks live in Chico, right? So um, it, it eventually came out. Um, and I, then I had the amazing experience of being able to travel with him and his distributor around London That's for the insane. next few days yeah, and go to breweries and restaurants. It was ridiculous and a blast. The chances of that <laughs> are very slim. Yeah. Totally, totally. And that's actually why she does what she does now after meeting <laughs> the owner of Sierra Nevada. No, so, so I, I quit my job. Um, I started working at this pub. Uh, the pub gave me the flexibility to kind of continue doing some of the research I was doing. But also within a few months, I had two more teaching jobs. Mm. Um, and so I was 
hired uh, at the University of Greenwich, uh, in addition to Birmingham, and then had a, a side gig at the University of Nottingham. And, and anyway, so I was doing all this research for actually some years about Louisiana um, uh, from London. And, and you know, I, I will say there's so much value sometimes in being able to get a little bit of distance of from mm. the intensity of the environment that Perspective you care so much about. From yeah. halfway across the world. Absolutely. Um, but in England, there's no summer school, right? There's no summer courses. So uh, each summer I would return to the States to work. So in 2012, I was working in New York. Uh, my job from London supported me to go there. Um, and then in 2013, I came back to the States to work at the Coastal Sustainability Studio Got it. Um, at LSU. At LSU. And yeah. Was, and so that was that was a clear how you are where you are now, right? I mean, yeah, or, kinda. or no. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So I was just there for a few months. Yeah. Um, and uh, my boss at the time said, you know, Liz, uh, civil engineers are over there, architects, <laughs> landscape architects, coastal scientists. You know, we work with these social scientists or economic advisors, legal team. Uh, get to know everybody, all the projects everyone's working on. Come up with a design project where everyone can be involved. Love it. Uh, and then we're submitting that to these folks in New York who you may know. Um, uh, Wait, now that you're telling me this, this, though, like, that's summer. literally, I mean, you're managing all of this talent. It's really scary. It is, but you're man- you're put immediately in a management role that you're managing all of this talent of people in extremely different disciplines and backgrounds, yet are all brilliant in their own ways. Totally. And with all the same interests. I have to be honest, I thought I was going to come back and, like, live with my brother for the summer and just, like, have beers on the porch and relax. <laughs> <laughs> it was not that. Um, Which is a typical Louisiana summer. Right. <laughs> a typical, typical summer. Um, but I will you know, the, the differences in language for those folks, right? Oh, You're using sure. the same vocabulary. Right. And I'm not talking about terms like resilience or sustainability or equity that kind of everybody has this amorphous amoeba-like definition of. Um, but things such as land, right? What mm. is land and how is it defined? Um Thing, you know, it, it was so fascinating. Like, I learned very quickly um, that having an all staff meeting all the time was not productive at all mm-hmm. uh, because we would get into these tangential field wide debates um, about, you know, do you define land by being able to float? You know, if, it, if you can float a toothpick on the water above the surface uh, of the land, wait, is it wait, land so anymore? Now I want to know. Like, okay, now I'm thinking, like, how do you define it? Is it what is marsh? What is land? What is, you know, a stick right. of reeds? What is. An alligator, like, can you stand, <laughs> if you can stand on an alligator, you is it stand land? On it, like, what's the, what's an oil? <laughs> so how do you I mean, define it? This yeah, is good. This yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. And honestly, in Louisiana, um, everything is mush, right? Everything, it, everything is, is mush. everything is, but it's gradients of Ooh, mush. That's a good one. Um, and, and, and the sort of clay soils. That's going to be our title, by the way. Everything is, <laughs> hashtag everything is mush. Everything, everything is mush. I'm getting that bumper mush. sticker. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the clay soils that we have here in New Orleans um, and across the Mississippi Delta are actually one of the reasons compared to somewhere like Miami, uh, that we can combat sea level rise, right? Every, mm-hmm. all of Southern Louisiana, most of it at least, was built by the Mississippi River over thousands of years of deposition, right? And if you think about, if you bake a cake and you're baking a layer cake, the Mississippi River used to flood and it was like every year put a new layer on that cake, right? right? right, right. So the highest grounds are actually closest to the former distributaries of the right. river system. Um, so all of you in New Orleans, everybody on Chapatulis, congratulations. Yeah, you're very yeah, high. but also Close the Gentilly Ridge and That's the Metairie correct. Ridge, right? Uh, there's a ridge that goes straight south out of West Wego. I mean, Ooh. like, yeah. we're what's, actually, what's the best ridge? <laughs> That's you know, <laughs> it, I feel like River that's an ridge? arguable. Is that's it? an arguable question. Well, you're the smartest person <laughs> in the room, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure what the best ridge is. I feel like you know the Mississippi River likely would have changed course by about 1950 if we Ooh. weren't keeping it exactly where it is right now. So uh, <laughs> after the f- there was a huge flood in 1927. Um, and if anybody wants to read more about this, there's a book called Rising Tide. Mm. Um, and uh, in after 1927, which like huge swaths of land, and I'm sorry, I don't know the actual acreage and square miles, um, but across a, a sort of, I want to say eight to 10 state area were Ooh. flooded. So at a federal yeah. level and differently from now, um, I think there was a, a more national recognition that the river was important to everyone, Got right? It. I think now we've like, We've kind of disconnected from the industry that is supplied on the river. Um, I and agree with that. and uh, so you don't have people in Ohio thinking about 
the levees in New Orleans as uh, as related to them. Or forget Ohio, you know, Colorado. You, at that time, you had people across the country lobbying uh, for these federal decisions about water management. Interesting. Um, many, many states away. Uh, and so now we're at this place where we made this decision after the flood of 1927 to levy off the river and to restrict where the river could go so that we could support economic growth and the growth of communities. Right. And so now in Louisiana in particular, because that levying off the river has meant that uh, we have reduced that fresh water and sediment that used to go into our basins every spring. Um, that has meant the collapse of the Delta. There's actually a National Geographic article from mm-hmm. 1897 that says, uh, you know, for, for three or four generations, it's going to be perfect that we levied off the river. Um, but by that fourth generation, the, the Delta uh. will be collapsing. Um, and so, but by that point, surely uh, uh, the, the entire country will recognize the value and have no problem putting in money we'll okay, well, uh, we'll to, to rectify that situation. I have a question. So I have my very limited understanding of this. So you, you levy up the river and that restricts the river from overflowing and, and pushing the sediment into the, into the Delta Plains mm-hmm. and into all those areas. More so importantly, now, into people's homes and businesses. But okay, yes. right. So, yeah. yeah, you're preventing that from happening, which is a good thing temporarily because then everyone sinks. But does all the sediment still go down the river and shoot out the Delta? Straight so you just off have, the continental shelf. So is it... Is it? Gr- oh, it's just shooting off the, sh- the shelf. So yeah. it's just sinking into the abyss. So the Mississippi River has kind of lengthened itself as long as as far as it can go at this point. The uh-huh. Bird's Foot Delta, which is at the end of Plaquemines Parish, uh, the sort of edge of Louisiana, uh, that's w- it. Sort of has met the continental shelf. So all of that sediment is wasted. Um, so. Uh, I will say, you know, indigenous people used to have no problem with these floods. You know, they used to move amongst them. They built mounds. Uh, they, they, they had more sort of temporary inhabitation when the river was where it was. Um, and it has only been since sort of Euro- European colonization um, that we have made these decisions to, to levy off the system. Right. So we went from um, this temporary lifestyle to yeah. now a very permanent lifestyle. Right, that which, doesn't know how to deal with water. Which has consequence. But, I mean, clearly we we're all making decisions, I suppose, at the time that are in favor of what we're trying to do, right? We're making what we think are good decisions, but there's there's always consequences. Given given what we know. I will say um, the state of Louisiana, uh, the Coastal Protection Restoration Authority, which is an agency that was established after Hurricane Katrina um, and is the restoration body. It's it's sort of the management of any investments to restore the coast or reduce flood risk um, in coastal communities. Um, the the CPRA has projects called river diversions, mm-hmm. which essentially uh, would uh, cut a controlled hole in right. the levees um, and maybe a controlled canal, if you will, uh, to allow for that fresh water and sediment to go back into um, into those basins. Wait, does this happen now? No, so they're working on them. Okay, so, so this uh, could happen. So it's they're moving happen. forward. So um, uh, th- they're they're. They're controversial because uh, the fishing industry has gotten quite used to where the salinity has moved inland. Uh Um, So as saltwater has come closer, that has meant that shrimp are caught closer and certain oyster leases are more profitable than maybe they were previously. Um, And so the state is really trying to come to terms with now, how do we resolve some of those challenges for commercial fishing? Given we have the largest commercial fishery in the lowest 48 states, lower Mm -hmm. 48 states. So it's really important that we solve this. Um, but how do we find a balance, right. right, with restoring? So people um, are getting comfortable based on where it is the, the river is now. You know, for the shrimpers, the shrimp aren't leaving. They're going to be in different places, mm-hmm. right? So how there could be questions asked for those shrimpers that want to remain in the industry. You know, how can we support you in a loan of $50,000 to scale up your boat or get a different right. refrigeration system, right? right? Um, so for me, this becomes a question, again, of bringing community into the conversation um, and actually uh, hearing from those people who are most impacted and closest to the repercussions. Uh, what, How can we help you and what would that look like? And I'm not saying that that's the end all be all, but how do we problem solve together right. um, and, and fix this barrier? So 
could you give us an example of that? So if you're part of this organization and you go to a community, like what, what what's an example of something that you would engage the community about? So a lot of the work we do is much bigger than just this this set of diversion challenges. Um, we we are in the housing space. We're in the economic development mm-hmm. space. We're in the public health space. Um, so I would say one of the barriers to coastal land loss and flood risk um, and restoration, frankly, being a major issue that all Louisianans can get behind. I mean, generally people are into it, but it's not like, you know, this is my thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Is that it's seen as only environmental generally. Um, And so... uh, And you're saying it's not. It's not. It has repercussions and ripple effects across everything we care about. So um, back in 2015, we had a grant from the... I'm sorry, 2016 uh, was when we actually started the work. A grant from the Rockefeller Foundation to work with Plaquemines Parish uh, to design a planning process that actually would bring them to the table from day one. What Mm -hmm. would that look like? And some of those questions are logistical. How many meetings do we have? At what scale? You know, uh, what barriers do we need to solve for? Childcare, transportation, food? Um, how do we have these very difficult conversations with folks? But also, um, you know, how do we solve for literacy rates and language barriers and the technical nature of flood risk information for the average Louisianan, which in some cases at about a fifth grade or eighth grade reading level. Um, So in last year, um, in 2017, we actually worked to implement this planning process with the state of Louisiana. So we decided to co-fund and co-manage between the Foundation for Louisiana and the state's Office of Community Development, that planning process as a project called LA Safe, um, Louisiana Strategic Adaptations for Future Environments. And if anybody wants to learn more, lasafe.la.gov is the website. Between March and December of last year, we had 71 community planning meetings. Wow. Um, it was well, a I have lot. a question about these meetings and just engaging just people in general. It's I I'm it must be difficult for you to go up to someone and say, look, you know, these things will impact you and generations and these these scales could be thousands of years. How do you get people to think beyond like lunch and dinner? Like like what Seamus said, like just getting getting beyond that level to, for people to be involved, it must think, be difficult. I think that's the right question. Um, so I like to compare it to trying to think about your retirement strategy when you can't pay rent mm-hmm. tomorrow. Nice. Um, it's just not it's happening, example. right? Yeah. So, um, but that being said, coastal communities know this is happening already. You're not bringing them new information. And frankly, it's problematic for any expert to feel like they are. Um, bringing them new information. People have personal experiences of these changes and they can talk to you about how they show up. They just haven't usually been given the chance to do that. Got it. Nice. And I'm sure you come across people who are also probably stubborn because they have lived in that their whole lives. So it's like, I know how to deal with this thing kind of deal. I mean, do you ever come across that? So, yeah. So um, when we talk about some of the, I would say, scariest aspects of sea level rise and land loss, um, you know, we were told before we went into these meetings that we were going to have our tires slashed and tomatoes thrown at us. And oh gosh. we were going to get kicked out of these parishes um, for saying, um, here are the maps. Here's 10 years from now, 25 years from now, and 50 years from now. Louisiana has some of the most sophisticated climate data. Um, uh, frankly, we don't call it that. But um, if you look at the, the appendices of the Coastal Master Plan, it's an international panel on climate change report right is that because um, like climate change climate data is like a hot topic and you don't want people to like get I think, latched on i think to it's that? because it becomes politicized um I, yeah i mm-hmm. think uh that being said we have lots of conversations with folks that are like if you just don't call it climate change right we'll talk about what the well, effects are wow. to be very um, frank though it that is clearly like the topic sure but you just have to be soft-spoken about it but I would say in Louisiana, the effects of sea level rise are not a future scenario Um, because of that deterioration of the delta that has already been happening for Mm -hmm. a century. The impacts of uh, sea level rise are more immediate. They're not 30 years from now or 40 years from now like they might be for other coastal cities. Although, you know, we also know that cities like Norfolk and Miami are not also experiencing, or Boston, Mm -hmm. not experiencing these in the future. Um, But because of that land loss historically, we also have the opportunity to go, Here's the data looking back. How have you experienced this? Here's the data we see going forward. Right. 
what do you think the effects are going to be? How do you think about your community? How do you think about your economy? Perfect. And also think about the environment as, as something that's tied to those things. I, I would also say um, for some of the scariest pieces of this conversation, we uh, had the opportunity to talk about that from a generational perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 10 years from now, you might be thinking about yourself. You know, Maybe you're thinking about your kids. 25 years from now, you're probably thinking about your kids or your grandkids. 50 years from now, which is when the, the, the sort of right. the 50 year planning horizon of the Coastal Master Plan, most people in the room are not thinking about themselves. They're thinking about their kids or their grandkids or the generations that come after them. So, mm. so what does that mean, right? And, and we saw residents willing to say, look, to your point, I'm never leaving, right? right. I'm going to die here. But my kids, they've already moved up the road or up the bayou or up the river, right? Um, or I want them to have a better life, and I know that this is happening. And so there's this thinking of it as immediate uh, is a challenge, but also thinking about it as too far out is also a challenge. And well, we so always have so to emotion- navigate that. This is so emotional. Yeah, and I, I love I'm this. I'm getting emotional. This, <laughs> this, I've got goosebumps. It's this delicate balance between science, facts. There are things that are happening that you cannot prevent. How can we help that? And then you're dealing with the emotions of people and their pride. And that is such a Louisiana Southern thing, you know, and an American thing. This is my land. This is my family. I will protect it. I will stay here. This is tried and true. Where in reality, the Delta, Louisiana, the coast is ever changing and we need to adapt to it. Yeah. Um, I want to kind of, I want to kind of move a little off subject to here. Um, Just we're, we're designers, all of us Mm -hmm. here in the room. Um, and I want to know a little bit more about example of design initiatives that um, we as designers can implement, whether or not we're architects or not, or we're landscape architects or we're civil engineers. Is there something that we can do or even homeowners that we can do to help either awareness or better design or when it comes to land loss, when it comes to yeah. these situations? Um, so in Louisiana populations, people are already moving. But let me be clear, the people with resources are moving, right? Mm -hmm. So hurricanes, Katrina, Rita, Gustav, Ike, and Isaac uh, since 2005. Um, If you have the financial and social capacity to pick up and leave and sell your house for way less than you might have bought it for or go move to a community where your family already is connected to, um, that's happening. So in the areas where... um, we're losing population, we see other effects there. There are uh, impacts to tax bases. There's less resources for maintenance of infrastructure, loss of social services. Um, Groceries get shut down. Schools, in some cases, get shut down. You have to drive an hour and a half for any healthcare service, Uh, right? But then on the reverse side of that, because when people move, they have to go somewhere, um, there are changes happening to those receiving communities, if you will. Uh, So all of a sudden your traffic is horrendous and your schools are double capacity. But for me, the most fascinating thing here is that development exacerbates those conditions because Uh. the parishes see that growth in population and they want to encourage it because it means tax base increase and more capacity to make investments and increase in wealth. Mm -hmm. Um, So they permit any kind of development that could Uh. possibly be put out there. Um, So slab on grade in the floodplain, go ahead. Why not? Um, Rental rental rates skyrocket. There's gentrification from those areas that uh, in those areas that can't accommodate uh, that growth in population. Um, um, and so in the areas like St. Tammany and uh, and East Baton Rouge Parish and Tangible Ho, like you see that growth in population and the development expand out into those floodplains at an obscene rate, right? So you look back at the floods here in Louisiana, those areas that flooded were a lot of the areas that have grown since 2005. Mm, interesting. Um, and so when you combine a one of the one of the changes that we see with climate change is that the precipitation falls more heavily and more quickly in shorter intervals and our drainage systems are not actually designed to have the capacity to respond to that quick influx of a lot of water right, right. you combine that 
with the fact that that water used to have a lot of ground to seep into. And now that's concreted over with, or is new homes as well as roads and other infrastructure. Um, and usually developers do as little as possible to invest in those systems, as, as little as they're required to do. So, so to come back to your question uh, for designers, yeah, right? Sure. Um, because I think the questions that you must ask are different in those conditions. We have a spectrum of uh, challenges for communities from those experiencing population loss all the way to those experiencing tremendous and rapid population gain. Um, in those areas that we don't expect to be there 50 years from now, um, that means being thinking about temporary measures. That means right, thinking right. about architectures that maybe are, are designed to fail mm, in some ooh, ways. Interesting. Uh, right? Um, and, and designed to maybe serve a different purpose when they're no longer there. I had a student uh, back in 2000. 14, the fall when I was teaching fourth and fifth year architecture at LSU after I had returned to the States. Um, and she was looking at the migratory patterns of birds and how many, uh, f about 5 million migratory birds pass through Louisiana. Um, and, it, and a lot of that goes through Grand Isle and Grand Isle is losing land at one of the most rapid rates. Um, and she she was designing architecture to create a, a sort of concrete habitat. terrace and habitat that yeah. was elevated long yeah. after the island was gone, right? Um, and that's the Abby Brown, so innovative. I got to right? review her, actually. Yeah. It was, it was actually an awesome project. Oh, so no. I, would, I would never want to be reviewed by you, Seamus. Um, You're so I am very opinionated, dashing. but if I like it, I'm all, I'm all in. Um, no, I love that concept. It's so romantic. It's like yeah. you're not just thinking about this, you know, this immediate, you know, first five, 10, 50 years. It's like this is what an happens, investment. What, what happens, happens to my after? castle? And yeah. No, it's a, it's a great it, as a student. I don't think she realized how powerful of a project it was, but it was smashing. Like, And how fitting it is because it's not just a fantasy. It's it's not just this romantic fairy tale. It's real. Like it's This is, a, real. This is something that we can... We can think about. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, I think there was a whole set of students in that 10-person studio that I had that I would have... If I could have just taken that project and let's work together to like make that a reality, it would have been amazing. Um, that Grand Isle Studio, which was funded by Louisiana Sea Grant and the Coastal Sustainability Studio, really was a design challenge. There's an opportunity to think about how you design with water right. um, and how you think about what a section looks like and how program is distributed across that section, mm -hmm. um, what it means to have facilities that could be compromised, elevated higher up, right? We don't put the appliances on the ground level. We don't put uh, any electrical wiring two feet above the floor. Uh, you know, what does it mean to think about uh, residential structures for that working coast, to think about uh, the ecotourism economy that we still expect to have um, even as the coast transitions? Um, and, and Seamus, finally, you know, to the, to the sort of higher ground community challenge. Mm -hmm. um, this is a tremendous economic opportunity and someone's going to take advantage of for it. Sure. For sure. Um, and we need to be thinking about always stormwater management. We need to be thinking about green infrastructure and how to develop strategically and uh, densely in those high ground areas, limited high ground areas, especially in South Louisiana that we do have. We need to be thinking about multiple purposes and multiple benefits. We need to be thinking about uh, some of the mistakes we've made in development over the last few generations and what to not do going forward. We also need to think about uh, the reality of displacement. Um, and I, I want to be clear, coming back to that point of the people with resources or the people that are moving, communities that have seen disinvestment or underinvestment historically, typically marginalized communities, often communities of color, and here in Louisiana, very often black and indigenous communities, um, those communities experience a heightened and exacerbated uh, set of effects in response to risk. Um, so when we think about those receiving communities, how do we think about affordable housing? How do we think about growth in a way that is inclusive um, and that connects economic development and transit opportunities to the people who, who need them most? Um, and how do we think about how all of that 
is able to accommodate really the effects of this changing climate and the continued migration uh, that frankly, Louisiana is only one of the very few places in the world that is talking about it happening. Love it. Liz, Liz for 2020 for president. No, um, I don't want to be a politician. <laughs> I like being exactly who I am too much. <laughs> um, and on that note... Liz for 2020. <laughs> Honestly, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, me, as a designer, as an architect, James and I, here, everybody at Cicada, I think we can really take a lesson from what you were talking about. And since that architecture, specifically, is not about our current owners, um, it's about the future, right? So mm-hmm. when even, even though you have an office building or a house coming in, um, you have to think really about long-term, long-term environmental issues and like tenants and people because... People come and go. Mm-hmm. You could have an owner that comes in and needs a building for five years, but in reality, someone's purchasing that property after the fact. So I think f- for us as designers, we really, um, it's, it's up to us ethically and morally and environmentally to really design for the, um, the conditions that we live in, um, for those structures to be able to withstand 50, 100, 150 years. Um, so I think that's a, everything that you said uh, really inspired me as a, as a designer. Um, to really think about architecture in a different way. Yeah, go get it. For those of you um, who were not with us earlier, we did a little uh, Instagram live. We went live. (laughs) We went live for a hot second. And we shocked Liz. Poor Liz. She literally literally walked through the door. James and I were kind of, you know, decided to go live for... We're just going to try it out. I was was still on my walk here. We're going to start implementing it. So anyway, uh, we were implementing it. We're testing it out. Liz walks in, and boom, we had some questions from our Instagram followers. Right. We were crowdsourcing our questions, and we had a few good ones, and you had some really great answers for them (laughs) right on the spot. We did not tell her she was going to be answering these questions, and she did. She crushed it. But I think we should bring up at least one or two. Yeah, Um, I think think one or two are pretty good. Um, And again, you can just kind of answer these you know, j- uh, briefly, briefly, you can answer these briefly. Um, one of the questions was, if you just bought a house in New Orleans, <laughs> am I insane? I just did that. And I do feel insane. <laughs> we are actually a lot better off than a lot of, a lot of other coastal cities. I mentioned yes. earlier that uh, I know that's okay. shocking to everyone. And, and, um, and what coastal cities are you talking about right now? Uh, parts of Miami or Boston or Norfolk, you know, not everywhere because there will be some areas right. that are fortified and it, it's worth it. Uh, I think it's worth just uh, mentioning that it's not, we're not here alone. It's, it's no, co- our problems is are, very far reaching, very far reaching. And right. again, lots of places, especially as we improve on our capacity to engage uh, communities in the development of design and decision making practices are, are lots of places are looking to us. Um, but I mentioned that most of southern Louisiana was built by the Mississippi River over thousands of years, sure. Right. But, um, you know, we arguably have the capacity with each of these river diversions to build about a square mile of land a year. Wow. Um, uh, with each of those projects. And and still, the river has a lot of sediment capacity. We don't call it the mighty, muddy Mississippi for nothing. Um, so how do we how do we strategically use that river um, and think innovatively about how we um, uh, shift some of our investments, whether those are industrial and economically based um, or, 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 or whether those are, are um, more community based? Mm-hmm. Additionally, um, post-Katrina, some, uh, some, we did get investment in a 14 billion dollar levy system right right um so a lot of the issues that it had before katrina were realities of different construction techniques different funding sources different timelines literally vulnerabilities in every different bend in the levy it's it's shocking to like look into the engineering issues there but after katrina it became federally made consistent Ah. right and 14 billion dollars of investment in that levy system i don't think there's another place in the country likely to get that level of investment from the federal government without putting a much more significant sum in on the ground so another reason why you're not that insane. Go ahead, James. Sorry, I was going to say this is a good transition, a good segue into the the money side of things. So if you had no money. an unlimited amount of money oh, geez. with your knowledge and power, what would you do with coastal restoration, flood mitigation, and potentially saving Louisiana if you had from a magic wand. the very not- climate change things that are happening? I would invest in our community partners. 
first and foremost, community organizations that don't see themselves as environmental. So your neighborhood association, your faith-based oh, organization, your community organization, whatever it is that you care about, right? Maybe that's your, maybe that's your swim team. Maybe that's oh, your yeah. church group. Maybe whatever it is, right? Invest in those partners and provide them the opportunity to connect their own personal experience of flood risk and flooding uh, to these larger data sets, right? And to these larger opportunities, right? Spend money to get them connected to each other. I would, I would spend money on organizing and advocacy there. At the same time, we have $600 million a year coming every year for the next 15 years Ooh. from the Deepwater Horizon settlement. Oh. All of that money is money going for what? into restoration projects. Perfect. Which is great, but none of that money is currently staying here in Louisiana, or not enough of it. Wait, right? why? Because we're not necessarily um, requiring contracting pri- practices that um, require prime contractors, maybe even if they have to be global institutions, to hire local subs who hire local people. Mm. So how do we invest in a way that connects uh, the people who need jobs here in Louisiana to those amazing economic opportunities? I don't think we've ever in the history of Louisiana had such a sustainable funding source that we know that money is coming on this day of this month right. every year right right how do we leverage that so wow. i would i would put, put, put a little bit of catalytic money into that um i would invest in so we were asking the silly question but this money exists oh yeah no there, it's insane i mean it's not enough right well, like it's not enough but it's a it's a big down payment but i love it yeah <laughs> i love your answer though is that really bringing the community together we are so we don't talk to one another y'all right? our Spread destinies our yeah. destinies are tied together yeah and this is not a time or a space to be timid. I want to. So I want to ask you. So you, you grew up both in New Orleans and in Memphis. You are making change in powerful movement in the coastal resilience sector. What is the advice that you would give yourself, whether it's as a kid or going through architecture school or even in London? Follow your intuition. Uh, learn a set of rules. Right, how those each each sort of game or system operates, and then find a way to. Uh, understand and critique yourself, but also uh, live by that sort of uh, gut intuition and improvisation and drive. Well, the, your drive is clear. We could definitely see that, and it's you know we're very happy to have you here. I it's hope contagious. I hope one day <laughs> people run into you at a pub and they say like, "Oh, Damn. I, I found Liz, and she was amazing." I'm gonna and be the bartender again. Just give me a second. Perfect. Perfect. Um, but yeah, it's been great having you, and I, I hope that our listeners you know, uh, look up some of the things we've talked about, some of the books, the websites. There are ways to make Louisiana um, a better and wonderful place, even though it already is. Yeah, There's always room for improvement. We are not just mush, even though we stand on mush. We float on mush. We float, and thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. And, folks, that's going to do it for this week's episode. I am Seamus. And I'm James. And we would like to thank our sponsors, Brew Caray and PJ's Coffee. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, at The Swarm, and drop us a review on iTunes. Stay tuned for our next episode.